Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, where we're exploring the films of Joel Schumacher. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hi, everybody. And we're being joined once again by our guest from Cousins, Lore. It is an honor to be back. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome back. Now, in the time since we did Cousins, and that was probably like four or five months ago or something like that, Mm -hmm. have you had any other encounters with the films of Joel Schumacher since? I had actually put a couple of his films on my list to rewatch. Didn't get around to it, but then I haven't seen any movies, I feel like, in a few months, so... It's been busy and they seem to be disappearing from the theater quicker and quicker. Yeah, especially if they're not the big ones. Yeah, exactly. So Dying Young, is this a film either of you had ever seen before? No. No, I hadn't seen it. I was aware of it, but I had Mm -hmm. never seen it. I didn't even know it existed. I remember hearing the title. I know this one got a lot of play on TV during the 90s, -hmm. but it's not one I've ever encountered. It's one of those ones growing up in the 90s, it wouldn't have interested me as a teenager. Right. I was like, this isn't Hackers. (laughs) (laughs) Dying Young began in 1989 as the debut novel of Marty Limebeck, who continued to be a best-selling author with the likes of Sundial Street, Love and Houses, Daniel Isn't Talking, The Man from Saigon, and Age of Consent. The origins of this film actually go back to Steel Magnolias. The producer of the movie Mm. who bought the rights is Sally Field. I noticed that. I saw that, yeah. She had picked up the rights because she worked with Julia Roberts on Steel Magnolias, really enjoyed Mystic Pizza, and was trying to find a star vehicle for Julia Roberts and had gotten a hold of a manuscript of the novel before it had even been published and instantly licensed the rights. And it took several years for them to get this off the ground because Julia Roberts for a while there was was getting a lot of attention, but she was still kind of unknown, mostly did supporting roles. And then you suddenly had the one-two punch of Pretty Woman and Flatliners. Mm. And suddenly she shot into stardom. Julia Roberts, who had been working with Sally on this project, suddenly had the pull to get her own projects made. She had just done Sleeping with the Enemy, which had also been a rather significant hit. Basically, the studios were like, what do you got? We'll throw money at it. And Julia went to Joel Schumacher, with whom she had done Flatliners. We'll get into a bit of his history on the project, but he was just coming off of the initial attempt to make The Phantom of the Opera movie, Hmm. which got held up by Andrew Lloyd Webber getting into a divorce with his wife and a huge legal battle over the estates of all of his creations. I didn't know that. Wow. Which dragged through courts for years. Phantom of the Opera was going to be Joel Schumacher's next film, but then the rights all got tied up to hell. Oh my god. The screenplay was by Richard Friedenberg. Interesting history. He actually came out of the 70s where he wrote and directed The Life and Times of Grizzly Adams. Okay. So this was written by the guy who gave the world Grizzly Adams (laughs) and also did the sequels and also did the short-lived TV series. Hmm. And then continued on with a couple other 70s TV movies like The Deer Slayer and The Bermuda Triangle. And then just struggled to get anything done during the 80s. But then in the 90s came back as both a writer and director and did things like A River Runs Through It, The Education of Little Tree, 12 Mile Road, Susan's Diary for Nicholas. Basically, he just kind of then descended into lush Western TV movies. Hmm. But otherwise, nothing really major to match the success of the life and adventures of Grizzly Adams. (laughs) And this is a film that had a bit of a turbulent history behind the scenes, but we can get into that in the discussion. California Valley girl Hillary O'Neill is living with her mother, struggling to find a job, and just found her now ex-boyfriend cheating on her. Seeing an ad for a woman with nursing experience, she meets Victor Geddes, the son of a wealthy businessman. Victor has been fighting leukemia since he was a teenager and needs help getting through the side effects of chemotherapy, while also focusing on completing his art thesis. Though his violent illness initially shocks Hillary, she sticks with him, and when he pressures her into accompanying him on a date, a relationship begins to grow. Victor suddenly announces that he's completed the recent course of chemo and invites Hillary to accompany him to a small shoreline town upstate where they rent a house and awkwardly settle in among the populace. 
When Hillary starts to bond with Gordon, a local handyman over their similar tastes and upbringing, Victor begins lashing back with his higher class trivialism, <laughs> which is made worse by him becoming visibly unwell and sluggish. When Hillary discovers not only that he's shooting up morphine to deal with his cancer, but that he intentionally left chemo before it was completed, she calls Victor's father to take him home into the hospital. After what's supposed to be their big farewell at a town party falls into awkwardness, <laughs> Hillary confronts Victor, discovering that he's planning to run away. She pledges to stay with him as long as he'll return to treatment. If he dies, he dies. If he lives, he lives. But she'll stay by him through all of it. As they walk off into a sunrise, credits play over the sweet sax of Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did notice I that. that sounded familiar. Mm -hmm. Oh, the credits even say, saxophone played by Kenny G. It's like right after the cast list. And at the party, up on stage, playing the saxophone is indeed Kenny G. You're kidding. That was him? Wow. He's there. Now I gotta go back oh, and Oh, I gotta rewatch that scene. And it's not doing that jazz clarinet that he later became famous for. He's doing full sax. Okay. That's amazing. This completes the Joel Schumacher saxophone trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> with St. Elmo's Fire and the Lost Boys. Oh, that's right. That scene in the Lost Boys. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. It's all coming together now. You need to see St. Elmo's Fire where Rob Lowe was wearing a yellow bat sleeveless tee while rocking a sax. Mm -hmm. I do remember the sax scene, yeah. Yeah. The sax scene. <laughs> <laughs> see, that was a PG-13 sax scene. Lost Boys was a full R. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this one's G. Kenny G. Yes. <laughs> So, Angie, do you recommend Dying Young? Uh, no. The title alone is honestly something I would never really be drawn toward. I'm sure The Fault in Our Stars is also a wonderful movie. This is just not the kind of genre that really appeals to me personally. But on top of that, Victor is just a bad person. Mm -hmm. I don't like him. He basically stalks her. I can see what the movie is trying to do, and I'm sure we'll get into that with the art stuff. But yeah, I really don't like him, and so it made it really hard to feel anything for their romance or his tragedy. Laura, do you recommend the movie? No. <laughs> I have a lot to say about it, actually. <laughs> I do not recommend this film to anyone. However, with one caveat, I do think that the first 15 minutes of the film could be taught in any screenwriting class because the economy of the screenwriting, the way that Julia Roberts' characters fully realize when she has less than a few sentences of dialogue up through the time that she goes to the interview, it's perfect. It's really well made. I mean, I was actually preparing to enjoy this film from the part where the credits open to the part where she actually gets to the house. It was amazing. I'm so disappointed that it ended up like it did. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend it either. There's aspects to it that are very well done. I think both the lead mm. actors give very good performances. Almost all my problems are the writing. I just think, yeah, mm. Victor is a really, really uncomfortable character. And not just because he's suffering, but just in the way he uses his suffering to manipulate mm -hmm. people, the way he treats and pressures people. And I don't buy the romance. Nope. I was with this movie for the first half. While I still had my issues with Victor, I was mostly with it for the first half. I thought there was a lot of good filmmaking on display, a lot of nice world building, scenic construction, all that stuff. It was well made. It didn't mm -hmm. grip me, but it was well made. Then like around the halfway point when they move upstate, mm -hmm. it just just all falls apart for me. Again, there's good moments, but the story is wandering around. It doesn't know where it wants to go. From what I hear, there were a lot of reshoots and a lot of retinkering on this film, and you can feel it. Mm. It feels unfocused. Yeah. A lot of what it's focusing on isn't working, and it ultimately just kind of abruptly ends. Yeah. A very bad ending, too, I thought, yeah. because it didn't really either go with closure or with the bravery of taking a stance one way or the other on what was going to happen to him. I think it was vague in the worst way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and nail that ending first, where you know, she gives the big speech about, you know, I'll always be with you, I'll always be by your side. And this mm -hmm. film that's this entire thing about coming to terms with your cancer, coming to terms with your mortality, still ends on an entirely open note. Yeah, you don't know what's going to happen. We just know that she's going to stick with them. Mm -hmm. And they just walk off into the sunrise. That's it. Yeah. In the original version that they wrote and filmed, he committed suicide. Oh, see, now that would have been interesting. I felt like that's where it was going, I so, so that doesn't surprise me. That's why mm. she rushed back to the house, right? Isn't that what she right. was afraid of? I thought suicide by morphine was going to be the end of this mm -hmm. movie. And while I don't think it would have necessarily made the rest of the movie more interesting, I think that mm. would have been a choice as opposed to no choice. Right. Yeah. In the original book, 80% of this movie is not from the book. Okay. Okay. Very little of the book is 
is in this movie, the majority of this movie is its own original thing. Hmm. I'll get into the book a little bit later. I hated the book. <laughs> wow. In the book, she comes back to find the house is already full of gas. He's set all the burners and is going to kill himself. Mm. She drags him out and they have a conversation and then she allows him to go back in. Oh, wow. That's dark. I could see that as a potential possibility. That's the thing is like there was so much, I don't know, vagary is the right word, but they were so all over the place that, yeah, mm -hmm. I could see her supporting an assisted suicide as much as I saw her trying to save his life. It was yeah. very bizarre. Could anyone figure out what it was that he was attracted to in her besides the fact that she had a rock and bod and she was Julia Roberts? I think that was mostly it from I what I could tell. I think that's entirely it, yeah. When I got to the end of the film, it was like, what is it about her that makes him want to? She I wore could the not short figure skirt. It, it was like they failed that <laughs> angle entirely. I think what they were trying to go for is that she turned down his father's money. When he was doing the whole pay her for the cab and she's like, I don't need your money. But he was leering at her even before that. Exactly. I think they're trying to do that, but it's not selling. It did not. It just no. seemed like he was a creep and she was a woman who fell for a guy and needed some help. And yeah. I mean, she seemed like a good enough character, but the whole thing seemed very morally bankrupt. The thing that bothered me is basically every stage in their relationship, he pushes her into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When he invites her to the house, she like sets up the boundary. This is my room. You do not enter my room. When he initiates the date. Yeah. It's not just, hey, thank you for taking care of me. Can I treat you to dinner? It's, will you go on a date with me? And then, right. you know, when the butler comes, it's an awkward scene where he's like, oh, she was going to accompany me out, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was weird. I did not like that. And then the whole thing when they're at the cabin and he's like, I need to sleep in the bed with you. Oh, my God. How manipulative. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. I can't sleep. I need to lay down next to you. Again, it's playing on the sympathies. Uh-huh. The one thing I'll give is the scene when they finally do sleep together. There is a slow enough build to it that he is allowing her to consent to everything. But still, it's like by that point, it's like, why is this continuing to escalate? Honestly, when he finally says, I love you, the look on her face and everything she had been through up to that point, I really felt like she could and she should have said, you're a creep and this needs to stop now. Every single time he does something like this, her face looks like red flag warnings are going right. off in her head. Yeah. And yet right. she still goes with it. Yeah. It's so frustrating. Because she feels sorry for him. I don't see anything yeah. about this guy that if the circumstances had not been that she was taking care of him, there's nothing in her personality or his personality that would have led them together. It's not right. like a rich guy meets a girl from the other side of town and they get involved mm -hmm. and he sees that spark in her. They were trying to do that, but what they ended up doing was just having him patronize her all the time. Yeah. And they even literally did two scenes in a row that perfectly pointed out how incompatible they are because they go to the fancy restaurant. Yep. She hates it. <laughs> then they go to the dance club. He hates it. And they never find a medium. No, they there, don't. There's no common ground. There's never a moment of like, oh, but we've got this except for she takes care of him. Yeah. Although I do have to say, I kind of did like that they went to the dance club and instead of him being like, wow, this is how the other half lives. I'm really enjoying it. He was like, no, this sucks. And she was like, yeah, this kind of sucks. And I kind of did appreciate that they didn't make it all. What can the poor people of Oakland teach me about my life? <laughs> right. Yeah. I was afraid they were going to go for that angle. Well, and then remember the whole thing where he's like, here's how I can repay you. I can teach you about art and oh, all this stuff. God, and he never yeah. really build on that anywhere. That was so pretentious. How about pay for her to go back to school? That would be better, at least. Because mm -hmm. oh. we get that great scene about when she finally learns what chemo is, she actually then hits the library and starts doing research and learning about right. it. Yeah, she was yeah. smart. Yeah. She did everything she needed to do to take care of them. Why couldn't they have focused on that? She would have made a great nurse. It's offensive mm -hmm. that they make it about this fact that this woman is supposedly from the... Although, I mean, she doesn't really come off to me as somebody who's not smart, not with it, not worldly, not together. No, not, not at all. Yeah. It's not really the wrong side of the tracks. It's just they're both from different sides of the tracks. Right. right. But I felt like the movie was trying to push on me this idea like, oh, she doesn't know anything. They make mm -hmm. it this weird class thing. Right. Yeah, right. It's very strange. It doesn't seem like she'd be that uncomfortable in his social situations. So it just came off like he was really out of touch, Rich. And in that way that movies don't really show anymore like you know those kind of late 80s early 90s wealth fantasy films where the butler's got mm. like the silver platter for the mail they had that in this movie yeah. that always mm -hmm. makes me laugh and the whole thing that he's 28 and he never learned how to drive because his father always had a driver right it's ridiculous instead of you know thinking yeah. wow that guy's got it made i thought this guy's life sucks mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't do anything yeah 
that's the biggest flaw of this. It's a romance where I don't know why they fall in love. No, other than just that bond of yeah. like when you see somebody at their worst and you want to help them. Sympathy play, power struggle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ethically very ambiguous. In fact, I think it would have made a great horror film <laughs> because I feel like as a woman who is as smart as her character is, and I really did like her character up until the point. I feel like Julia mm-hmm. Roberts did the best she could mm-hmm. with the character. She was great. I agree. But up until a certain point, it kind of felt like, hey, here's the smart girl who gets into this situation. It's a little bit shady. He's a little bit weird. It could have easily escalated into a fantastic stalker horror film instead of settling for a sad melodrama. If I'm going to die, I'm taking you with me, basically. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> they should change the title. I don't want to die alone. <laughs> <laughs> Dying alone. Yeah, there you go. And then the whole scene where she confronts him with the morphine, you suddenly get that power shift where he shoots out of the bed and is like wrapping his arms around her from behind and is like doing the whole thing. If you love me, you'll let me do this. If you love me, you'll let me die and all Mm. stuff. And it's such an uncomfortable scene. I'm glad you have that turn when she pulls out and then she has her big speech Yeah, where Julia Roberts really does pour out a really great performance there. But it's Mm. that entire scene is just misplayed. On a script level, this romance is poorly written. Mm -hmm. I think Victor, they never cracked as a character. And I think Joel is just not figuring out how to direct it, how to pull it off. He's not saving it in the direction. Did you guys notice he couldn't even settle on an accent? He kept doing that phony, I'm a private school boy accent, and then he started slipping into his regular voice. Oh, that's actually just what Campbell Scott sounds like. Seriously. Oh, no. I feel bad now. <laughs> it did sound like he was all over the place. You know what it reminded me of? Did you guys see Vampire's Kiss? Well, you know that's George C. Scott's son, right? No, I didn't know that. You know, sometimes it's like people try to get rid of their accent, but then when they're heightened emotionally, it yeah. kind of comes back. It could have been that kind of effect, too. I, don't I thought know. he was putting that on. I feel terrible. I'm like, he's doing a terrible imitation of a rich guy. <laughs> no, Campbell Scott, he just has this odd timbre to his voice. He's yeah. always had that. Okay, that's just Campbell Scott. He has to do voice acting, right? Because I know I've heard his voice yeah, before he's at done least. Stuff. Yeah. He still pops up in movies. He's never like hugely taken off as an A-list star. This was around the period he had just had one starring role before this. This was like his big feature debut. And then he did have a few other roles, but he usually always fell into like ensembles or supporting roles. Mm. Like more recently, he played Peter Parker's dad in the Amazing Spider-Man movies. He was on Royal Pains. He was part of the main cast for a long time. And he's done an animation voice acting. Okay. Oh, by the way, little trivia note. The older woman that they meet in town who runs the winery with the maze. The Ellen mm-hmm. Burstyn, right? No, no. Ellen Burstyn plays her mother. Oh, that was Mrs. O'Neill. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Who played the older... Is that, That's um... Campbell Scott's actual mother who died right after filming. So this was her last oh, film. No. Oh, no. Oh, that's sad. She got that great scene about, you know, how she buried three husbands in the maze. And I was like, yeah. everyone, you know, prides you for being strong and all stuff. But it's like, you just literally watched people die before you and had to bury them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was really good. That was a nice moment. But again, that would have been better in a horror film. The maze with the dead husbands in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been a great touch. Well, and again, it's weird that this came out right after Sleeping with the Enemy. You know, the whole abusive husband movie. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then tying into the whole ending thing, what do you think about Vincent D'Onofrio as Gordon? What was funny was, because I didn't know what this film was about, I thought it was going to be him as the lead guy that had cancer because, you know, he's the bigger name in this to me. So Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised to see him in that role. I didn't dislike the character, although I felt that they were going too heavily on the whole idea that the minute the victor's out of the picture, he's going to pounce on her. But I did like how earnest he seemed. I just felt like a lot of the scenes where he and Hillary were, I guess, bonding over their middle class background with television it felt kind of forced and over the top. Yeah, definitely the same. Like, once again, it's like, does this writer think all men are stalkers? Or does he not yeah. know the difference between a stalker <laughs> and someone showing their interest? If they had just had the two of them bond over, like, the Jeopardy moment, that's a really fun moment yeah. mm-hmm. in and of itself. But the whole thing with the windows and the way he keeps, if you need me, if you need me. That was creepy. It's like, dude. He is literally all <laughs> over her like the small town guys and straw dogs. It is uncomfortable. Yeah, like. It is very uncomfortable. Way, way too much. Way too much. But the character could have worked, but he was just such a stereotype of right. whatever the writer thinks is yeah. the typical blue collar guy. It didn't need to go there that far to get Victor jealous and uncomfortable. Oh, no. Absolutely not. Because he was already out of his mind with jealousy to begin with. Right. It just seems so silly. I really did hate that scene at the Christmas dinner where he was Oof. uncomfortably shouting out his own Jeopardy questions. It was like watching a 12-year-old have a tantrum. Yeah. Yeah. And then stumbling all over himself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God. 
a large part of what was cut out of this movie was it was a romantic triangle. Okay. What? After she leaves Victor and, you know, with the whole confrontation over the morphine and everything and then leading up into the big party at the end, she actually does sleep with Gordon. Okay, so instead of them just showing up at the party suddenly together, there was at least build up to that. Yeah, there was more of an establishment of those two finding a romance and her when she learns that Victor is dying. In the book, it was that she was looking for something that would last Mm -hmm. because she's suddenly confronted by the mortality of, I've been given everything to this guy who's just letting himself die. Mm -hmm. And at least this other guy knows how to live. You know, I I think it was supposed to be the idea. That makes sense. But I feel like the only thing those two seem to have in common was that they both watched The Honeymooners. I mean, he wasn't developed enough to be a a romantic partner for her in any significant way. And then so the final scene was her having her final confrontation with Victor leaving, he commits suicide, and she's driven off by Gordon. Whoa. That version actually test screened, and audiences hated it. I could see that. And part of that was Joel never wanted to do the suicide, but it was tied in through, you know, the author had some level of oversight. And when Mm -hmm. it failed in the test screenings, then that was where he was able... Joel wanted to do a more, you know, let's move forward and face this together type of ending. Which is what we essentially got. Yeah. But it really wasn't an uplifting ending because nothing actually happened at the end. He could never crack it. The material wasn't there and his direction wasn't enough to overcome the fact that the material wasn't there. That's the biggest problem with this movie for me. Joel has been very open about regretting aspects of this movie because when the whole Phantom of the Opera thing fell apart, he... He also, right before this movie shot, went to Europe to visit a friend who was dying of AIDS. Oh my god. Mm. And instead of making the material more personal for him, it was almost too hard, so he kind of emotionally pulled himself back from the material a bit. I can understand that. Gotcha, sure. And I think that's why there's aspects of this movie that are just kind of lacking that human connection, that passion. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you could see him trying. I mean, there's still great sequences. Like, I genuinely think when we have the first chemotherapy sequence and the whole, here's what that does to a person, Mm -hmm. the whole montage of him sick and shivering and hallucinating hallucinating and vomiting. Mm -hmm. That was good. Yeah. It was incredibly well put together. There's good sequences like that throughout the film. I mean, even the maze sequence is really well done. Yes, agreed. What's interesting, though, is a lot of the way this film is shot is very different from what we've seen in a lot of the Joel movies, where it's a very still camera looking from a distance, and there's a lot of zooms, like the camera physically zooming in on things. And it's only in those moments, like, you know, the maze and the chemo sequence, where it's suddenly being shot like the crash table scenes and flatliners, where it's handheld camera with a wide angle lens. It's very in your face in the middle of the moment. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, it just pulls back and is just kind of lingering as it looks. And, you know, that can be a very effective film technique, but it keeps you from being able to get in the material. And again, the way the material has been crafted, it's just not working. Yeah. I love the setup to this movie. I just don't like where it goes. Right. Back to the way that the film was set up in the beginning. Because I didn't know anything about this film, I thought this was going to be more a film about Julia Roberts discovering herself in life. And I feel like if they had kept with her, but instead they focus so much on Victor's malaise and just the way that he talks down to people and he's Mm -hmm. obsessed with his art, but he seems to be kind of out of touch with the real world. And I feel like a more likable character taking a back seat to her story might have been more interesting, which isn't to say that he should have had to grapple with cancer or just to teach her something. But I think that it could have been a story about her learning about love. Yeah. And instead, it mm-hmm. was kind of just a creepy story about two people that didn't really belong together. And I felt sorry for her because it felt like she was suckered into this relationship. And then he tried to make her somebody that she wasn't. Mm-hmm. And then in the end, she kind of just settled for him. Well, like I was alluding to in my non-recommendation, they draw these parallels with the impressionist painter that he's so enamored with. Yeah. And how this guy was painting pictures of a naked 16-year-old girl, hello, and was like totally obsessed with her and just eventually moved on and just dumped her. And it's like, they're making obvious, I mean, even to the fact that the girl in the painting has red hair to Julia Roberts and the way Victor is looking at her. And it's just like, they're both creepy and wrong. And again, it never leads anywhere. It's like they (sighs) set up that theme, but they never bring it up again. But they've got that Klimt painting at the end, which made me think... Are they saying that he's found in her what Klimt found in his young muse? But then he left her. So what's the point? Well, but now they're going to go together. I guess. But it didn't seem like Julia Roberts needed him for anything. No. No, she didn't. 
I think part of it, they're also setting up an escape for her. She wanted to get away from her mother. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who wouldn't? (laughs) Well, I mean, that's kind of why she even... I mean, the dude locks her in the room for the interview. Like, he's so creepy and wrong. But it's like, oh, well, here's a place to live. Sorry, it was a joke. Ha ha. Yeah. (laughs) was so awful. Here's a place to live away from your horrible mother. So, of course, she's going to jump on it. This is a hard film to look at in the post Me Too era. Oh, God, it is, isn't it? It's just like everything it does in in this is wrong. Red flags, red flags. But I always try to put myself, if I can, the position of someone maybe seeing this for the first time in the early 90s. Because, you know, I was young, but I was watching grown up movies and I didn't have the experiences of adulthood, but I tried to imagine, like, would I empathize with these characters? And I can't imagine anybody finding Campbell Scott's character particularly sympathetic or interesting or romantic unless they were just a sucker for a hard luck story. I mean, what was the appeal? Yeah, I mean, you feel bad for him when he's going through the chemo, but every other time he's just awful. The thing is, they even make a big deal about how, you know, yeah, he used to be on the track and field team. He's had moments where he's been in remission and he's been able to live his life. Mm-hmm. But they still make him this very shut-in, nebbish. He's never really had experience with a woman before. He's never had relationships. Instead of, you know, make him the socialite who used to have all this success and glory and all that stuff. And that's all in the past now as he's had this take it all away from him. Mm -hmm. Instead, they make him this shut in nebbish who doesn't know how to talk to people, let alone women. He doesn't know how to talk to people. Yeah, when they talked about his first girlfriend, you know, I got sick and she left me. I thought maybe she left you because you're an asshole. Yeah. Are we sure that it was? I would have. I mean, shit. Yeah. You would stop showing me those paintings. (laughs) I get it. (laughs) Enough about Klimt. Yeah, he couldn't even find the Clint. Oh my god. <laughs> he probably couldn't. No. No. Again, it's like there's a good movie here, but it really needed work. And Joel is we encountered this with some of his stuff in the seventies too, you know? Mm. In terms of doing romances. Yeah. He's not this sweeping romance guy. So it's like you need someone who can bring that to the table who isn't him, and he'll find out how to do it well. And again, I think Cousins really benefited from that. It had a mm-hmm. really good script that he was directing. Yeah. And this one, I don't think the life and times of Grizzly Adams guy <laughs> was adequate for figuring out how to, how to make this romance work. Clearly not. It doesn't come together. Just a bit out of his wheelhouse. Yeah. And if you're saying that the original work wasn't that, I mean, I know it's not the same, but you know, when you don't have a good starting point, that doesn't help either. So you read the book? I read the book. I'm glad it was only 250 pages. Yikes. (laughs) Let me just bring up. So basically the book, she knows he's dying. He intentionally left the chemo treatments because he just doesn't want to go through that anymore. She knows that. It's not a secret. It's not a mystery. Okay. And the book is them already living in the house on the shoreline. I think it's set up in New England instead of California. I can't remember, though. And she's already begun her relationship with Gordon. Okay. So they're not romantically together. They're just together so she can take care of him. Okay. Right. So it's basically the last 40 minutes of the movie is kind of the book. Basically, that scene at the dinner table with all three of them where he's just incredibly patronizing is the entire book. Mm. So wait, they're not even together, though? They're together, but she's also with Gordon. Oh, okay. So she was with him and then she kind of has an affair? Yeah, she's having an affair, but it's an affair that Victor, it doesn't take long for him to reveal that he knows about it. And he doesn't really care because he knows he's dying. And basically, she's with Victor out of a sense of obligation because she doesn't want him to die alone. And she's with Gordon because she needs a sense of stability to deal with the fact that she's with someone who's about to die. Oh my god. What a miserable... I know, and he is just the most toxic, vile individual Victor in the book, where he's just Mm. constantly shouting and patronizing. He was the rich society guy who lived it up with lush parties, had a lot of affairs with women and all that stuff, and has had that all taken away from him, and he resents it. Mm. It reminded me a lot of, do you remember when we did the Incredible Shrinking Woman episode and I read the Shrinking Man novel? Yeah. And it was just, again, dealing with a person with a debilitating illness who's just... 
using it to lash out at everyone. And it's like, I get it. There's a lot of bitterness that comes from that, but we never see anything but that. Yeah, that's not good. And the book doesn't have any of the backstory. We don't really find out how mm. she came into his employee initially, how they started their relationship. All we know is that he's avoiding his dad. They've run off here. All of that backstory was invented for the movie. Wow. Gordon is someone who it starts off kind of nice, but then whenever they sleep together, then he just starts stalking her, showing up everywhere she goes, calling her every night saying, I can't stop thinking about you. And she's like, look, I love you, but I want to be with Victor while he's gone. He's like, but I must have you. Oh, God. (laughs) Oh, my God. And she just goes with it. She just keeps going with both guys. And it's just the most toxic book I've ever read. (laughs) Yuck. That's horrifying. I mean, at least Twilight had abs, you know, but this one... It's literally the most miserable book around. Mm. Again, there's no real story to it. And then, of course, he commits suicide at the end. She goes off with Gordon. Great. The maze comes from the book, but in the book, the old woman, she's again a rich society gal. She still dresses like an old flapper. She's like an 80-year-old woman who's basically dressing like an old socialite from the 30s. She Mm. throws these giant parties like every week. Her calling the father and the father coming back into their lives, that's from the book. Okay. They basically just ran off in their own direction with this. I don't blame them, man. That's mm-hmm. some weird Sunset Boulevard shit right there. I wish they had kept going. Like, watching the movie, I don't even know why they left the apartment because they spend so much time establishing the world of that apartment and using that stark setting to tell the story that I almost yeah. wanted to stay there and see how that continues to grow as a character as the story continues to develop. We didn't need to go off to this shoreline town. We didn't need Gordon. We didn't need any of this other stuff. They couldn't use the set anymore and they had to go. I don't know. <laughs> Oh no, we can't continue renting a bare apartment. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We'll have to get a nice big house out on the shore. But it's like they set up the butler character and then never do anything more with them after they leave. Yeah. That butler was hilarious. That poor guy walking on all the steps every day. There's no reason (laughs) to keep spying, Malachi. There's always a reason, so. And it's like sometimes it seemed like he was the one who loved him more than the dad did. Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know. It was so bizarre. You know what I thought was really weird about the film was that there was two scenes that I thought were interesting and made the film a little bit more ambiguous. And one mm-hmm. was where she's cleaning out his cabinet. She finds all the Playboys and she's kind of like, oh, and it's kind of an interesting reaction because it makes you think she sees this and thinks, wow, he's really lonely. And I get that. Oh, uh, he keeps his wank material in the kitchen. Right. And, and he thinks, oh. <laughs> You know, but I kind of get that because it's like she's thinking, oh, this is like all he has to look forward to, you know, Mm -hmm. because he's not dating anybody. And it is really sad and kind of a weird, creepy way that he keeps a bunch of Playboys in the kitchen. But I digress. And then there's that scene where they're talking about how she doesn't want to be paid for the work because she feels like it's wrong. And I feel Mm -hmm. like they should have made more of that in the film because ethically what's happening is wrong and it's kind of weird and it's kind of creepy and there's a power differential and there's a fact that he's her employer technically especially Mm -hmm. if the father's not really hiring her and he is and the fact that he's paying her to kind of date him is what it comes off as and i thought it was good that the movie brought it up and i wish they hadn't dropped it so quickly because i felt like that should have been much more of a struggle for her well and then it just becomes so i'll stop paying you right doesn't he say something like that yeah yeah, but it doesn't really resolve the issue that you're dating someone somebody in your employ and she's being compensated you know she's living with him i mean the whole thing is just so ethically ambiguous i did not like that and the thing is you know in terms of ethics you can have a legitimate relationship come out of a situation like that but not Mm. the way they did it but again it's all about how you do it and how you play it right right and it just seemed like she was sort of falling for his sad sack routine and, and he was miserable and then she kept letting him get away with it and then they were suddenly sleeping together wow. i never even see her falling for him i see a no, whole lot of this feels say. uncomfortable okay oh no i don't mean falling in love i mean falling for his <laughs> bullshit yeah right but yeah she's kind of going along with it it seems like and that really skewed me out like is she that hard up to get away from her crazy doll mom that she's willing to kind of live in this guy's house and be his play girlfriend play wife they have little teeth do you like the little teeth that scared the shit out of me when she came out look at doll with teeth i remember thinking that's a nightmare of its own it's like julia roberts is so smart that even she knows this is so horribly written that she can't help but look disgusted and like she wants to get away from him like nearly all the time 
it's the classic example of she said yes because she was written to. Yeah. But yeah. it's like everything else in the situation, the way the scene's playing out, the way she's reacting to it mm -hmm. is a, the answer should be no, but she said yes because that's what was on the page. Right. Right. It kind of went against what the movie itself cared. I love that scene where she walks in on her boyfriend sleeping with another woman and it's quick and it establishes exactly what happened and nothing happens between them except mm -hmm. she throws her keys back angrily and you can tell she's pissed and there isn't a big diatribe about it. There's no talking, mm -hmm. but you understand exactly what kind of woman she is. She doesn't take that kind of nonsense. So why is she taking it from Victor? Yeah. I just don't buy it. And that's just, I think no. that's the biggest failing of the movie is it just doesn't work. Yep. So how about the Kenny G sacks? <laughs> They should have panned over to Kenny G at the end. Like yeah. He could have been on the beach shirtless with a saxophone. That would have been great. I was like waiting for you to send me a music video link because I'm like, I know I've, I've heard this song before. Did they not make it into a video? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's James Dewan Hour doing the score again. I wouldn't be surprised. Let me look real quick. I mean, my parents listened to Kenny G, so it may just be that I know it because <laughs> they had it on an album or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here, a music video theme from Dying Young. How depressing is that title? It actually looks like it's a more recent video. <laughs> oh, okay. But James Newton Howard, it's a very typical James Newton Howard score. It's serviceable. Mm. It's bouncy. It's unmemorable. It just has a really nice sax. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking. It's mostly just montage of the film playing under mm. with shots of Kenny G. Maybe I have seen it. It's not directed by Joel. We don't have to cover it. <laughs> Maybe I have seen it before. I don't know. Anything else anyone could think of to bring up about the movie? Much like Twilight, I got the uncomfortable feeling while I was watching that if they had switched the role of Campbell Scott playing Victor Geddes for somebody who was twice her age, it would have played out exactly the same way, mm -hmm. but at least been honest about how vaguely creepy it was. Well, the way he behaves, <laughs> if she had been in her mid-20s and he had been like 15, it would have played out the same way. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and been just as uncomfortable. It would have been just yeah. as uncomfortable. I could also see this being played as a much older man who has a pretty young nurse because that seems to be all he wants her for in the beginning is just somebody hot to look at and spend time with him so it doesn't really seem like he's looking for a relationship so much he's he's looking for a piece of julia roberts and i found it so uncomfortable that they were playing it off like oh this is a normal thing for a romantic relationship developed between these two people after all they're both in their 20s that's kind of disingenuous <laughs> i mean a way you could have done this is instead of seeing her in that opening scene if he had just heard her that'd have been great and again what perked his ears was her turning down his father's money yeah. and then you know have the relationship be that what draws him to her is that she doesn't care about the wealth mm -hmm. i still don't know what draws her to him but if you know the whole <laughs> class difference between them is something that initially is appealing and then as the story goes along becomes something that he again starts to resent her for and that she doesn't respect his wealth or something like that. But again, it's like, this mm. is a story that doesn't end with these two coming together and being happy. No. Or if it does, it has to build in an entirely different way. Because again, I looked at some of the contemporary reviews of when this came out, and it's basically Love Story, but with the gender swapped. Mm. Oh. There was a film called Love Story with the woman dying of cancer. I remember that. And then what's again odd is so much of this plot also mirrors Pretty Woman. You know, yes. the woman who's hired, yeah. gradually becomes a, an actual relationship. Should I take the money? Should I not? It has a few two many echoes. I gotta mm -hmm. be honest, when I was describing this film to somebody, I did say it's like Pretty Woman with Cancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there is definitely mm -hmm. a weird undercurrent of her being paid for her services far too long into the film. I felt that the film should at least be more honest about what was going on. Even, you know what, if they had made this movie and it hadn't been based on the book and they had made it about Julia Roberts as a young, tough woman angling to be with this guy so she could get his money, that would have been more interesting. That would have been more dramatic. That would have been something. I hate how wishy-washy these people are. Mm. And again, it doesn't work that he's hiding things from her. No, it doesn't. Right, right. And lying to her. Yeah, you really got to change his character from the ground up. I mean, the whole we'll face this together should be the midpoint of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like the first half of the movie should be, look at what it's doing to him. Can I deal with this? And then being like... I'm in this with you. And then the second half of the movie should be him struggling with, was it wrong of me to pull her into this mm -hmm. as he's increasingly deteriorating and dying? And then, of course, right. ending with, you know, some kind of a either he sends off or they're together or whatever. Just in terms of like the barest arc, it doesn't work. Mm -mm. Even stripping this down to its basics, it just doesn't work. 
Wouldn't it have been wild, though, if, like, he did end up keeling over and dying in the maze with all the other dead husbands? Because I kind of thought that was going to happen when he fainted. What if he had died, like, when we still had half an hour movie left, and it's just kind of like, well, what happens now? <laughs> that would have been amazing. And then the rest of it is them trying to solve the maze to find his body. <laughs> now it's a thriller. Yeah, there you go. See? I'm thinking of all kinds of ways I could have improved this film. But it's in like her dealing with his father and having to deal with, you know, making sure that he gets laid to rest in the way he wanted. And that would have been interesting. The struggle with their relationships. What's going on with her and Gordon? Does she really want to do this now when she's still grieving? And how does she fit in this small town that she came to to help this guy who's suddenly gone? When she comes back, she can't really go back to that apartment. She's got to go back to her mom. You could have really done, you know, something that, okay, if we're going to just actually have him die, have the remainder of the film be playing out. Well, what's her life like in the wake of that? Or what I would have liked is if he had died just being completely unredeeming the whole way through. And then after his death, she has to cope with the fact that this guy didn't really do much for her, didn't love her very much, but she still feels guilty about moving on because he died and they were both young. So that could have been interesting. You know, that could have been something beyond melodrama. It's one of those things you either needed to fix the toxicity in the material or you needed to embrace and explore the toxicity in the material. Mm -hmm. Be honest about what it is that you're making, you know, make it something. Not just pretend it's a romance. Yeah. And instead it's just toxic material. Yep. And don't even want to say it's like completely unaware because again, it's a film that they admittedly, even Joel is like, we never cracked it. Mm. It needed a better writer. Why did you make it if you didn't get it? (laughs) I don't know. <laughs> Your big project literally just fell apart. This actress that you really loved working with has this dream project that she wants you to help with. It's just one of those films that it just kind of fell into place. Mm. And I don't think it was the right film to make at that time. But once you commit to it. Yeah. I just, why did she want to make it? Because like I said, her, her face the whole time is I saying. I think it was like a prestige thing for her. This though, right? dude because, is gross. Why right. do I want to do that? I don't know. You can imagine as a woman in Hollywood in the 90s, in the early 90s, trying to make a breakout role. I think that something like this, which I did see that she did win a MTV Movie Award yes. for breakout <laughs> performance, which is actually kind of cool because they recognize that she was a terrific actress. To have her on screen being kind of the driving force of this film, that would have been nice. I don't think she would have turned this role down. I can't yeah. see that happening. Yeah. This is the first Joel Schumacher film to have the prestigious honor of being nominated for an MTV Movie <laughs> Mm. Of all things, dying young. Given that our last film was his first one to get nominated for an Oscar. (laughs) (laughs) I think the thing is, is Julia Roberts, even though this was her dream project, I don't mean this patronizing, but she's not a writer and she's not a director. Well, sure. That's true. Yeah. She's not a storyteller who's shaping the material. And, you know, it's a lot of actors who even have their own production companies are very aware of that. And that's why Sandra Bullock makes very sure to get people who are very good writers and very good directors. Tom Cruise makes sure to get like the top talent he can to make his movies. I don't think Joel Schumacher was a wrong choice for this. I think the guy who wrote the screenplay was the wrong choice. I think the script was not developed enough. And I think Joel tried his best. I think, again, he had just gone through something personal that prevented him from emotionally connecting to the material. But even then, I still think there's a lot of strength that he does to the direction, but he's not saving it. He's not able to rescue Mm -hmm. the material because it's too compromised. And I think that's something that we're going to run into. We're going to start hitting the Joel Schumacher films that people are a little more openly mocking of. Mm -hmm. As we move away from Joel writing and controlling his own projects and starting to take stuff for hire, how does Joel do when he has a script that isn't there? How is he at developing someone else's story? Right. It needed a better writer. I think that's the biggest thing is it needed a better writer. And Joel, I don't think he had the time to develop the material. And I don't think he was connecting to the material enough to properly develop it. And it's also fair to say, like, I'm sure those interviews, it's easy to look back and realize that you made the mistake at the time. He may have thought, you know, that it wasn't that bad and he was doing what he could. I mean, obviously he was going through something emotionally. That's the thing people forget about a lot of the mistakes that people make is that, you know, at the time, they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were making the right choice. Right. So it was like, hey, I get to do another wonderful film with Julia Roberts. It's a romance drama dealing with the struggle of cancer. That's a very weighty topic to explore. We can get some really great performances out of it. And he did. The performances are mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. And once again, a very different film than what he had done before, yeah. which goes along with his liking to do something a little different every time. And it's, again, the mortality theme, like from Flatliners to this, too. It's mm-hmm. Flatliners, of course, it's a much more in-your-face exploration of that. Yeah. 
I don't think it was a wrong choice to make. I don't think it was wrong for Julia to want to do this story. I just think it wasn't fully cooked. Yeah, I mean, I think somebody should have looked at that script and said, okay, we need to do a couple more drafts on this and make some improvements. I'm surprised he didn't bring back the writer who did Cousins with him to do a polish. Maybe there wasn't time. Yeah, it could just be also that, you know, you had to sign on and it was something they had to start shooting right. that was already kind of locked and they needed a director. Mm-hmm. Once her career yeah. took off, they maybe wanted to make it as quickly as possible to mm-hmm. keep it going. Oh, yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, fun little trivia fact, Julia Roberts is wearing a wig and extensions for most of the movie. What? That's not her real hair? It did look amazing. She was always famous for having that big head of red yeah. curly hair. Mm-hmm. She had just cut it short before shooting. <gasps> no, oh my okay. god. <laughs> the film that she did right after this was Hook, where she played Tinkerbell. She didn't have it that short. That is a short hair wig. But, you know, there's the scene where Tinkerbell becomes full size and is wearing the gown and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's where Julia Roberts' hair was then. It was still kind of long, but it was just right above the shoulder. Okay. They oh. wanted that whole long flowing mane because, you know, they were right on the success of Pretty mm-hmm. Woman, damn it. And that's her signature look. <laughs> yeah. So they gave her the... I mean, it did look good, I have to admit. It, yeah, no, it mm-hmm. didn't look like a wig or extensions. No. It looked like her hair. And I like the scene with the mayonnaise. Yeah, what is up with that? That is something we really do, though. Okay, I don't do that, but maybe it's their type a of hair. A lot of women used to do that. I don't do it either, but that used to be very common. Is it a redhead thing? No, no, no. Any type of hair. It's, mayonnaise okay. is actually... It's basically eggs and oil. Well, yeah, and a, right. a lot of hair care products, which I've run into because I'm allergic to eggs, have egg protein and, and oil in them. Yeah, so it was very common up okay. until, I would imagine, even up to the 80s and 90s, for women to give themselves a cheap at-home mask with a bottle of uh, mayonnaise. Hmm. I can't touch okay. the stuff because I'm not a fan, but it's very good for your hair, apparently. I have put eggs and olive oil in my hair, so I can contest to that. I mean, it's egg whites, and egg whites are just pure protein. Yeah. It's basically like mm-hmm. a protein treatment with a lot yeah. of oil to make it all good and gushy. Yeah. It's a moisturizer I've thing. I've just never seen that before. Yeah. I'm sure it smells terrible. <laughs> okay, we need to experiment if you get some mayonnaise and Jack. Oh my god. <laughs> see what his hair is like after a mayonnaise treatment. Well, he cut his hair, so... <laughs> Uh, okay, get Hood, run it into his beard. <laughs> Mm-mm. So otherwise, I don't really have much else. I have something nice and lighthearted. Sure. Mm, please. With Joel as his fashion design past, I'm glad that we documented the moment in time where it was okay for women to wear a bra with a jacket over it. Yes. And call that an outfit in the club. Oh, a bustier. Yeah, that was really big. <laughs> I remember that was Selena's signature look. Yeah. Yeah. Remember? I love that It was that the look. fly girl look, yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought that was so hot in the early 90s when I was a kid. I thought that was the coolest you could look. I remember that specifically. It was a really sequiny bustier with a jacket yeah. over it. It's shoulder pads. And I love yeah. that Julia does some cheesy like neck dancing. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Doing the chicken peck. Yeah. <laughs> that was a it fun It was not scene. the wedding scene from Cousins, but no, it was but still it was, fun. She looked like she was having fun. <laughs> that was it. Yes. Yeah. We needed more of that and her token black friend who says girl. Right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, come on, 90s. Yeah. Don't give me this. Why was the friend there for like two scenes and then never again? Right. Yeah. And remember his driver, Momar Gaddafi? Yeah. Yeah. That was real. Okay. Thank you. That wasn't just me, right? Where I was like, wait, what? Is this funny? Yeah. Again, it could be a decent character, but all they make him is the name joke. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. is that supposed to be funny? Like, is that the character? That's it? Somebody had a chuckle about that and put it in a script. When they drop him off, he's like, do you want me to help? And she's like, no, just go. Yeah. It's like, why is this here? What is the point of this? Well, and again, if they had never left town, these are characters that you could have continued to build and grow on. Again, it's like the butler. Yeah. Because they decided to move to the small town, it's like all these potential characters and threads are just left in the dust. Mm-hmm. The editor on this one, Robert Brown, who at least did the initial cut, and then uh, Jim Pryor came in for some of the reshoot editing. Robert Brown, this is his fourth film with Joel. You had done Lost Boys, Flatliners, Cousins before. As we mentioned with the economy of the opening, Joel is still really good at montage. You know, he's really good at using just a lot of quick images to build a scene. I did love that. But it never feels like he's rushing through any of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Costume designer Susan Becker, she, of course, also did Lost Boys, Flatliners. Right after this was when she did True Romance. Okay. And Body of Evidence with Madonna. (laughs) And her last film was Sergeant Bilko in 1986 with Steve. Oh, wow. (laughs) I remember that movie. Hey, you know what's really weird is on IMDb, the 14th billed person in the cast is Alex Trebek (laughs) because of the Jeopardy scene. That's how few people are in this movie. And the screenwriter of this movie, Life and Times of Grizzly Adams guy, is credited as Jeopardy contestant. Oh, I see that. I see that. (laughs) Because they used a clip of an actual episode of Jeopardy that he appeared on. Are you serious? Okay, that's hilarious. I guess that's how (laughs) they were able to get a hold of it. (laughs) 
nicely done. Maybe like when he wrote it, he was like, I remember some of the questions. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else to add before I jump into the box office release? No. Nope. No. I don't have a budget on the movie. That's not one that's released. I'm guessing it's probably going to be around 10, 15 million at most. Mm -hmm. Though I found out they actually built that entire house on the shoreline. Oh, okay. Wow. They actually built that as like a film set house where you could pull away walls and all that stuff. Mm. Which again, if you had just not gone to the shoreline, you wouldn't have had to do that. <laughs> Dying Young opened on June 21st, 1991. It opened at number three. Wow. At number two in its third week was City Slickers. <laughs> oh, that's weird. A little bit different. At number one in its second week of release is still Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Okay. I remember that in 91. Mm -hmm. I remember that was a huge hit. Yeah. And then also opening that week at number four was The Rocketeer. I remember seeing that in the theaters. So if you could have that week gone to see The Rocketeer or Robin Hood or City Slickers or Dying Young... <laughs> I'm kind of surprised Dying Young did as well as it did. And also open yeah. at that time, you had in like their fifth, sixth week of releases, you had Backdraft, What About Bob, mm. Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, Soap Dish, Thelma and Louise, and Home Alone is still at number 12 in its 32nd week of release. Wow. I specifically remember 91 being one of the best years for film, period. Yeah. I don't remember everything that came out that year, but I remember seeing a bunch of tabulated results on that. So this was June? June. June, and people were still seeing Home Alone. Can you imagine? Yeah, 32nd <laughs> week of release, still at number 12. I mean, it had to be dollar shows, right? <laughs> no, it wouldn't be showing up <laughs> on box know. office listings. Yeah, because dollar shows, they don't even tabulate. Yeah, wow. Because, I mean, I remember those films used to be in the theater for a long time. They used to keep those films around forever. That's true. That's crazy. I actually, I found a budget for you. They say $18 million was what this was made 18. for. Okay, that sounds about right on the money. Mm -hmm. The thing is, this film, before they did the test screenings and they did additional reshoots and changed the ending and all stuff, was meant to come out in December of the previous year. If this had come out up against Home Alone, it would be dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. What a lovely <laughs> movie for Christmas, too. Yeah. Right. The studio also wanted them to change the title. <laughs> you know what? The title is one of the few things I like about it. I got to be honest. It basically yeah. tells you what you're getting, but it did lead me to believe it would be a much sadder film than it was. Yeah. Instead of just being infuriating. So in its second week of release, Dying Young dropped to number five. Not too bad. That's the week mm. that The Naked Gun 2 and a half, The Smell of Fear opened. <laughs> oh, yeah. Saw that in the theaters. <laughs> in its third week of release, Dying Young has dropped down to number seven. Oof. Opening at number five is Problem Child 2. Oh, boy. I think I went and saw that one when it came up. Same. And then opening at number one, it's a bit of an obscure sequel these days, but you know, it did okay. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. <laughs> Yeah, no one remembers that one. No. So in its fourth week of release, Dying Young is already down to number 12, so this won't go on much longer. Mm. Terminator 2 is still at number one. It had to stay there for a while. At number four is the opening of Point Break. Oh, wow. Keanu. At number three, the opening of Boys in the Hood. And at number two is a re-release of the animated 101 Dalmatians. Mm, oh, okay. I remember seeing that too. Yeah. What a great year for movies. And by its fifth week, Dying Young has completely disappeared from the box office. Mm. That is the week that Terminator 2 is still at number one. And Angie, can you oh, guess sure. what opened at number two? So wait, we're in 91. Are 91. we at Bill and Ted's Bogus Bill Journey? Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. <laughs> <laughs> that was when I was falling in love, you guys. It's <laughs> <laughs> the first one I saw. And I was like, <gasps> oh. <laughs> That was the first one you saw? I saw the second Bill and Ted first, yes. But that's wild. I think I saw the second one first, too, yeah. So ultimately, it did a box office gross of $33 million, and you said it gets an $18 million budget, and it pulled an additional $48 million overseas, so it total was $82 million. Okay. That's respectable. Yeah, that's respectable. It's not something that's going to break the bank. It's not going to make it a big success, but it's also not a bomb. Mm -hmm. And again, look at what it was opening against. Robin Hood, Terminator 2, Point Break, Boys in the Hood. I mean, these were <laughs> these were some big movies of the time. Yeah. That Robin Hood opening must have been one of the biggest for an R-rated movie. Was that R or was it PG-13? Was it? I thought I it was. I don't know. Maybe it was PG-13. Well, I mean, it's surprising that Dying Young is an R-rated movie. I don't know why it's not PG-13. Wait, it is R-rated? Other than him shouting fuck a few times. Yeah. Why would that? There's nothing in that that would even... That's really strange. I mean, other than language, and I'm guessing maybe they just counted disturbing content 
different from just the cancer stuff, yeah, but maybe that's, so. that's stuff you see in TV movies about cancer. That's really strange. What is going on with the rating system in the 90s? Well, I just rewatched Beetlejuice, and Beetlejuice has an F-bomb in it, and it's PG. Yeah. So I really don't get it. You could usually get away with one or two. Well, and it can't reference actual sex. And this one, yes. I know he, yeah. he said it about four times, and then they had the conversation the next day. He said, fuck a lot. Yeah. But I mean, that's <laughs> stuff you could have smoothed that out. They could have worked around that, my God. <laughs> no, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves was PG-13. Oh, it was. Okay. Laura, any final thoughts before we close up the episode? Oh, I just don't want anyone to have to see this movie without knowing exactly what they're getting into. So if mm. you're Julia Roberts completist, by all means, but otherwise there's no reason. Angie? Yeah, I mean, like, when we were going to record this episode, we were like, wow, it's not really on any streaming sites. It's what is going on now? No, okay, I get it. Yeah. Nobody needs to see it. You're fine. <laughs> If you really yeah. want to, go buy a bargain DVD, but no, you're good. It's a hard movie to get a hold of because, yeah, we actually had to reschedule because I even bought a DVD and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll trip the DVD and share it with everyone. Oh, did it not want to work? <laughs> yeah, I still need to go back and watch that 11 minute rip and see what they ended up doing. Yeah, it ripped as an 11 minute. <laughs> it was 11 minutes. It was like, yeah. oh, good, cool. <laughs> the things you do for this podcast. Now I wish I had just watched that one. <laughs> Yeah, we had to go to alternative <laughs> means in order to get everyone just to see the movie. Because it's not, yeah, you can't rent it anywhere. It's not streaming anywhere. Yeah. It's buried. So now you own it. <laughs> now I own it. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to upgrade to Blu-ray on this one. I don't think it's even on <laughs> Blu-ray. Can you imagine the Blu-ray out of this? Oh, Jesus. You can see every dribble of that vomit. <laughs> So yeah, it's one of those ones, I don't hate it, I can kind of see what they were hoping it would be, but they never cracked it. It's just one of those films where it just didn't come together. I don't hate it, I don't begrudge them for making it, it just didn't come together. No. Thank you, Laura, for once again joining us. Thank you, guys. I had a really great time. I love doing this with you. And it doesn't even matter if the movie is terrible, because I <laughs> found a lot to be upset about, and I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, well, good night, Angie. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Schumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. SchumaCast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Can I just say, I've got the IMDb page up because I'm terrible with the actors' names, and this movie appears on somebody's list of 43 titles called Movies I Used to Have. <laughs> it's so arbitrary. I love it. Used to. <laughs> Yeah. In case movies I ever want to buy them used again. To have, the yeah. movies that I used to have. <laughs> <laughs> and then just like wallowing, listing off titles. It's 43 titles. I'm going to click on it at some point. See what this guy used to have. God, I'm imagining that music video now. <laughs> just going through the empty shadows on a shelf that used to be filled with all the movies that I used to have. Oh my god. And then remember when Kevin Costner followed that up with Waterworld? Yeah. <laughs> Something I also liked as a kid, and then I watched it again as an adult, and I don't know what I was thinking. And then they followed up with The Postman. Never saw that, thank God. <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. I would love to see someone do like a parody video of how The Postman is all about the male gaze. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm not taking part in this. Signed, sealed, and delivered. Jesus. I'm just going to let it die. <laughs>